Hi guys and welcome, Knebon here. Today we will have the first of our new mini series of short videos where I'll be showing you some of the really cool stuff that you can program in the game using Scarpet. And the focus of these videos will be replicating some of the most useful things you would know from modded Minecraft. So what comes to mind when it comes to quote unquote modded? New pretty blocks, new tech trees with typically ridiculous uh, crafting rabbit holes, which at the end typically lead to fancy new tools and mechanics. And that's where Scarpet can come in handy. And I know what you're thinking, Scarpet is part of the Carpet mod, which is a mod, so it's not available in vanilla. And that's true, but the vanilla alternative, the current command and function system, it's really clunky to use and very limited. And while it might be possible to implement some of the new tools I'll be showing here today with data packs, it's likely ain't gonna pretty or ain't gonna function exactly how we would want it to do. With Scarpet, you can just run those plugins with your vanilla worlds and then when you're done with them, you can just go back to your vanilla game. The first thing we'll here start today with will be a hammer. It's something you would, for example, expect from Tinker's Tools. Since you would normally want to use this pretty much early game and just to hollow a large spaces of blocks rather than harvest ores, we'll bake this new behavior into an old regular stone pickaxe. So in order to get it running in an efficient way, random monitoring pickaxes uses from scoreboard will be using Scarpet event system. To demonstrate this, I created a simple Scarpet module called event test that will allow us to identify those basic events in the game that we are tracking. To turn the module on, it's very easy. Just type uh, script load and the name of the module and it's pretty much running. To install the module in your world is the same procedure like you would have with data packs. Just put them in the scripts folder of your world saves files and it will be immediately available in the game. And if we made some changes to the code, we can just simply load it back again with script load command and that would simply re-add those module again with the new code that you just edited. As you can see, there is a bunch of events that we can capture and to handle a specific event, we just need to define a function with these arguments. And if its name corresponds to any of these, these events will be automatically hooked up to a specific actions in the game. Pretty simple stuff. So as we can see in the game, when we move our character, we get tons of information about what's happening around the player. Every time player uses an item, interacts with a block, jumps, crouches, attacks and entities, etc. So we don't need to actively search for those. So to get the hammer going, we need to decide which actions we'll be using. If we right click on a block, we get tons of info like where, which block, uh, which side. If you right click in the air, we get a player used item action, which is yet another thing. Then if we, for example, attack a block or left click, we'll get information about the block and its side. And when we actually break the block, since the block is already broken at this point, we only get information about who did it and which block. So what we would expect from a hammer is to know which direction we'll be using to break these extra blocks. And this could be based on either the player facing direction or the face of a block that we are hitting. And these two different cases are actually quite prominent in the game since some blocks like locks, for example, get placed based on where the clicked block is facing. So I can place this lock in different positions depending which block face I'm clicking on. While other blocks, mostly rest on components like pistons, are placed rather based on how the player is positioned. So no matter where I click here, the pistons will be placed roughly the same way. Determining a proper 3x3 area based on player position would be much easier since we'll always have information about the player, but to base it on the face of the block that's broken, we would need to remember it when the player starts breaking of the block and use that information when the block is actually broken to break the neighboring blocks. Both of those approaches are valid ways to do it, but the ones based on the block face seems to be more widely used in modded. On top of that, we'll probably want to have some indication of which blocks are being targeted, not only the one in the middle that you can actually see being broken, and potentially add the ability to switch modes to make breaking area smaller or larger. So here are the two methods implemented. This one is the simplest of both, as since we rely on player position when we start and stop breaking the blocks, which is cool, and we just display particles the first time and break the blocks the other one, so what I added here is if a player right clicks with a pickaxe on the block, you can actually toggle between different modes, in this case 1x1, 3x3 and 5x5. And we can store that in the global variables. 
Now, we don't need to worry about multiple players using the same tool at once since when we load the module in the default mode, each global state or global variable on function are exclusive to each player. And when we load the module in a global mode by adding the keyword shared to the script load, then all the global variables and global state will be shared among players. It all depends on your application. You would probably like one or the other approach, but for tools, the default player space is probably what you need. So the other approach with the side of the block that we are hitting matters, not the player positioning. The code looks very similar. We just need to remember the range of blocks we were just playing particles on. And when the player actually breaks that block, use that selection for block breaking. The actual block breaking is done with harvest command, which is really handy because it makes sure that player can actually break that block and will also take care of tool durability, etc. But the only thing we need to worry ourselves is to skip liquids and air so we at least don't show these unnecessary particles to the player. So let's check how it works in practice. Obviously, we can change the mode with right clicking with a stone hammer on a block. Pretty cool. And we can go and break those blocks. Now, if I switch to survival, you can see that stone pickaxes are not really good in terms of durability and we could only be able to get coal and iron ore from them. But as an early game block clearing machine, it's pretty nice. Obviously, I coded here this into a stone pickaxes. You can go and change it for anything really, for whatever you want. So if you wanted to apply it to any pickaxes, you can always do that. So now what I loaded here is the other hammer that uses player position to determine everything really, like you would have with piston placement. But if you play it modded, you'll probably be more accustomed to the side block breaking. And for that, we can just unload this one and just load the first one. And now, as you can see, it works on the side of the block as we would expect it to do. Pretty cool stuff. The good thing about the harvest function it also honors players enchantment. So if we, for example, switch to a silk touch pickaxe, we could get smooth stone this way. Pretty cool, isn't it? The next tool on the agenda is prospector's pick. And in this case, we will be baking it into a gold pickaxe with a fortune enchantment on it, which is quite fitting. And the more fortune, the better the ore detection is going to be. So as you can see, it seems like it's everything is working at this point. So when we are on the surface of the world, we probe in the diamond level for ores and show particles with the color that corresponds to the ore. So light blue is obviously the shiny blue rocks and red is for example for redstone. And I decided to tier this one as well. So on the basic fortune one level, it only shows coal, iron and up until redstone. And in fortune three level, it detects all high level ores, just not coal and iron. So that's just one mode. And then if we pop into the caves, which we can detect by checking if we have terrain above our heads, we now be scanning in the area around us for ores instead of uh, showing the cloud particles on the surface of ores that are deep down. So now we will show the rays that beam directly from the ores to us. So let's quickly hop into the code and see how it's implemented. So here we have two functions that will check if the player holds a specific item with a specific enchantment and returns its value. This one feels a little simpler using a regular expression on a string to find what we need. And the other one uses a longer queries over NBT fields. And this one is actually about 20% faster. It's not that regular expressions are slow, it's just it requires the entire NBT to be serialized into a string, which takes a long time, while this one doesn't. But as I said, the difference didn't turn out to be that stark. It's about 11,000 evaluations of this one per tick. So 50 milliseconds for the first one and about 9,000 evaluations for the other one. And I'm talking about this one because this function will repeat quite often in various carpet tools as using enchantments to trigger some behaviors is something that makes a lot of sense. Then here I'm just defining a global list of particles you want to be using for which ore. And as you can see, nether ore is excluded from it since we'll be treating nether differently in this case. And here's a procedure that actually does the job. First is we have three types of ticks in the game, one for each dimension. And since they'll be accessing blocks from different dimensions, we need to have three different events. But it actually works quite well in this case, as three dimensions have different ores. In the overworld, we grab all the players that have our golden prospector pickaxes and check from 40 to 120 random points around them every tick for ores. 
If they are in caves, this surge is around them, otherwise it's just around Y8, which is just in the middle of the diamond level. Then we check if that block is an ore block, and if it is, what kind, and depending on whether a player is on the surface or in the caves, we just display appropriate particles, either as a form of a line to the player or as a cloud on the surface. In another situation is much simpler, there's only one ore and we are only in caves, so the nether tick is much easier to follow as we don't need to check for other things as well. Again, those are super easy to configure. If you want to check for more blocks, for example, just change this number. And if you want to, for example, scan a larger area, just change these numbers as well. And those tick functions, they don't need to run in a command block because we named them a proper way. So they'll be automatically added to the schedules to run every tick in those dimensions when you load that package. So that's how this prospector's pick would look like in the nether. As you can see, it's not that useful because there's plenty of ore already visible around us, but it's good to see what's hidden around the corner anyways. There you have it guys, two familiar mechanics that you'll probably know from modded Minecraft implemented as a scarpet scripts that you can load into your worlds. Good news, the work on the 1.14 carpet mod is pretty much done at this point. To run these scripts, you just need to check the most recent carpet mod release. In this case, I'm running version 1.0.1, .1, running on Minecraft 1.14.4. Just download the scripts from the links below. Customize them to your liking if you want, in terms of which tool you would want to apply to and how powerful they might be. Plug them into your world scripts folder and load with script load command. Similar the way you would do with data packs, for example. And that's it. So next time on the agenda, we'll have the classic, the vein miner. Oh yeah. And something you could know maybe from Monty Python. Maybe it's a modded thing. I don't know. A holy hand grenade. That's so cool. So what other tools and special mechanics you would really like to see that you may have seen in modded or maybe you just thought they might be very useful to have and wanted me to implement in Scarpet? Please let me know in the comments. I've got several other ideas working already, but I definitely missed some really cool stuff out there. So help me out with that. So if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave me a like, subscribe if you are new for more such content in the future and see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.